we have Dr. Rick Hong. Dr. Hong has been part of Delaware's Division of Public Health since 2005 as the uh, Office of Preparedness Medical Director. In November of 2018, he was appointed as the State Medical Director of DPH, bringing his expertise in healthcare logistics and operations, emergency medical systems, and emergency preparedness and public health to expand his responsibilities of protecting the public and the healthcare infrastructure from critical threats. He also serves as the medical director of the Delaware Medical Reserve Corps and Respond DE, acts as the medical liaison officer in the incident command of the State Health Operations Center and chairs the Delaware Ethics Advisory Group. Dr. Hong has been an attending emergency medicine physician at Cooper University Hospital in Camden, New Jersey since 2007 establishing the Division of EMS Disaster Medicine and was the Director of Special Projects and Operations within the Center of Urgent and Emergent Services, as well as the first Program Director of the ACGME accredited EMS Fellowship and an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at the Cooper Medical School of Rowan University. Dr. Hong is board certified in emergency medicine and in emergency medical services, completing his emergency medicine residency at Cooper University Hospital and graduating from University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. He received a Bachelor of Arts in Chemistry from the University of Pennsylvania and a Bachelor of Science in Economics in Healthcare Management and Policy from the Wharton School. Dr. Hong, over to you. Uh, great, thank you very much as I am going to Hopefully remember how to share my screen. I just want to thank Dr. Ortiz for um, the overview of other things that were going on uh, during COVID. Um, you know, it was very challenging for our team and want to give special thanks to our epidemiology team, uh, laboratory uh, folks as well too. Um, you know, even though COVID was pretty much our main focus, uh, other things were going on and we had to make sure that other diseases were in check, so to speak. So um, you can imagine early on when we did not have the extra staff we had now, uh, that basically our core epidemiology team was responsible for both COVID and non-COVID um, uh, events. Uh, so again, just want to recognize their hard work. Um, very fortunate now we expanded our team and have a separate COVID team and a non-COVID team. But initially it was, uh, you can imagine, a little hairy when um, we had um, our, 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 our team managing everything until we were able to expand our staffing. So just want to uh, highlight all their good work. So hopefully the share screening is working um, and uh, we can move on with uh, the presentation. So um, Dr. Hong, did you want to make it presentation mode before you start? Yeah, let's see if that works. Perfect. Thank you, Kate. Um, yeah, and this, this presentation, um, resonates a lot, uh, as you can imagine, for myself and, and DPH and probably everyone uh, on this uh, in the summit, uh, brings back memories, both good and bad. Uh, a huge success story, but also I'm sure each of us has uh, encountered some loss uh, during this event. So um, hopefully you will enjoy um, this presentation. Uh, when COVID-19 emerged uh, on the world stage in late December 2019, the, the Delaware Division of Public Health adapted by rapidly building our response capabilities and processes. Uh, we strengthened our existing teams and partnerships and created new ones. We met unprecedented testing and contact tracing demands with new hires and transitioned our inspection and enforcement duties to oversee business compliance. We delivered millions of pieces of PPE and launched an exposure app. Finally, we rolled out the biggest vaccination initiative our state has ever seen. Through it all and continuing to this day, we heavily relied on our health partners and citizens to do their part. And today I'd like to share details of the longest and most involved public health emergency this state has ever faced. So before we get started, I want folks to take a moment. Um, you know, we've been on high gear uh, for over a year and a half now. Um, you know, things are slowing down just a little bit, but unfortunately we're seeing increased number of cases. Um, and hopefully some of us had taken some time to kind of just take a pause and try to get our um, sanity back during this event. So, you know, this is a time just to remind folks to take a moment and talk about mindfulness. Uh, this is an article that was found in CDC uh, talking about the prevalence of mindfulness practices in the U.S. workforce uh, from National Health Interview Survey. Um, so just kind of talking about the importance of mindfulness and by definition, what is mindfulness? Uh, basically, it is the basic human ability to be fully present, aware of where we are and what we're doing and not overly react uh, or be reactive or overwhelmed by what's going on around us. And this was very difficult. Um, you know, we activated shock uh, 
level one in January. And, you know, I felt that um, at least for our team in DPH, we haven't stopped uh, since then. Um, and, you know, we had to remind ourselves how important it is to uh, provide self-care uh, and to make sure that we take care of ourselves. And it was difficult times because, you know, we take our job very seriously um, and we wanted to make sure we did everything we can during this COVID response. So um, just, just taking a moment, just how important it is for self-care and just think about some mindfulness. Uh, so if you have a chance to look at this um, article, at the end of it, um, the conclusion is worker groups with low rates of engagement in mindfulness practices could most benefit from workplace mindfulness interventions. So uh, I'm not sure how many organizations have uh, mindfulness uh, practices, but you know, given what's been going on and what still is going on, unfortunately, it, it might be worthwhile to kind of consider self-care and mindfulness within your workforce. So here are some topics of discussion. I might go on tangents uh, during this talk. Um, and again, happy to answer any questions at the end of this. Um, so we're gonna go over the general COVID-19 timeline. Um, I think most of us kind of remember what happened, but uh, we're gonna kind of provide our perspective uh, from a DPH uh, position um, and describe some of the high points uh, during uh, this COVID response. Uh, also, we're gonna focus on some unique pandemic chain challenges. Um, you know, we'll go over some other disasters that we've encountered in the past and how this one was so uh, different. Um, also going to review some infection control practices, diagnostics, um, of course, talk a little bit about the vaccine and then some other challenges as well that we encountered uh, during the overall COVID um, response. So here's our journey. Um, and, you know, even though our first case, um, presumptive case occurred March 11th, um, we were activated uh, early on in January. We've been tracking uh, this new virus uh, that started in China. And so we actually activate our state health operations center. That's our EOC or emergency operations center for DPH, uh, ESF-8. Uh, we actually activated to level one uh, in January 29, 2020. Uh, from there, we started focusing on efforts uh, of, of tracking this disease, understanding this disease process, as well as reviewing our pandemic preparedness and response plans. Um, we did eventually uh, increase our response to a level three, and we are still currently at the level three, which is the highest level of activation for our state health operations center. Um, again, our first presumptive positive case surfaced on March 11th. Uh, one day later, Governor Carney declared a state of emergency and has extended the state of emergency seven times and issued 27 modifications to it. Uh, governmental emergency declarations can activate emergency plans, authorize the deployment and use of personnel, and activate emergency funds. An emergency declaration can also trigger special powers such as group quarantine, mandatory testing and vaccinations, and activating retired health practitioners licenses. And we did all that in order to um, bolster our resources, including our workforce. Throughout the state's emergency response, Delaware Health and Social Services has coordinated closely with the Delaware Emergency Management Agency, or DEMA, the Delaware National Guard, and other state agencies, as well as valued health partners. For three months, DPH and those agencies support a joint information center for coordinated messaging and answering media requests. And our call center, activated on March 4th, continued to operate weekdays from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. So you can kind of go through uh, the slide. Um, you know, there's uh, March 13th, schools were closed. Uh, from March 16th to 27th, uh, you know, until we get a better sense of what's going on. Um, you know, school closure extended through to May 15th, um, and then eventually they were closed through the academic year. That decision was made in April 24th. Um, a stay-at-home order was issued on March 22nd. Only essential businesses were to uh, were allowed to be open. Um, we have unfortunately had our first um, uh, Delaware uh, COVID-19 death on March 26th. Uh, April 1st, public gatherings were restricted to 10 uh, individuals or less. Uh, we issued that mask mandate. Dr. Uh, Governor Carney issued that mask mandate on April 25th. Uh, we hit our 5,000 COVID-19 cases in Delaware on May 2nd. Um, we had our first community testing event using curative saliva-based uh, tests um, on May 14th. Um, phase one reopening begins on June 1st, phase uh, two on June 15th. Um, and then we had our newly hired contract tracing workforce go live on June 27th. So a lot of activities occurred. Uh, initially, again, we were still learning about the disease process and um, we're gonna talk more about some challenges specifically regarding COVID-19. 
So continuing our journey, uh, second half of uh, 2020, um, you know, highlights on September 15th, DPH launches free uh, COVID alert DE app to quickly alert users if they were in close contact with other app users who share positive COVID-19 test result uh, with the app system. Users can log their symptoms daily and check back and review at any time. The COVID alert DE app protects the user's privacy and does not collect or share identifying personal information nor use GPS navigation to collect movement or geographic location. Uh, this was a big deal and helped us uh, regarding contact tracing. Um, you know, the goal of contact tracing is to warn people if they've been exposed and potentially could be infectious and passing disease to others. This was one of our uh, important tools to limit spread of disease within community. Um, you know, during this time, uh, August 23rd, the FDA approved Pfizer's uh, COVID-19 vaccine, EUA. So, you know, since then we were planning on uh, vaccine distribution. Um, you know, we're closely with our partners within the state, um, also uh, with CDC. On October 16th, we submitted the first draft overview of the COVID vaccine distribution playbook to the CDC. Um, you can kind of see uh, the rest of the journey. Um, on August 25th, DPH issued face coverings for children guidance. Um, you know, we had announced prior to that that uh, uh, school reopenings with limitations. Um, October 1st, um, we provided some guidance on how to celebrate Halloween safely. Um, and um, many states, um, including ours, announced asymptomatic testing efforts on October 30th. Um, December 14th was an uh, important day for us. First vaccine shipment arrives in Delaware, and we started our distribution phase one pl um, plan. Um, still recall Dr. Rate, Crystal Webb, who's a direct, uh, deputy director, other uh, leaders within DPH actually uh, went to the warehouse. I think I got there maybe five o'clock in the morning, excited to see the uh, uh, two uh, containers of vaccine coming in. So uh, that was a highlight. Uh, we had a, a couple thousand initially coming in, and then when Moderna came in as well, too, um, we had um, um, some stockpile within the state. And we started dist uh, distributing our vaccines based on our, our tiered approach or phased approach, uh, starting with um, healthcare workers, first responders, and so forth. So there were still a lot of unknowns in 2020. Um, you know, hopeful that the vaccine uh, distribution was going to be successful. We weren't sure what our supply was going to be. Uh, so really, um, a lot of effort was placed in trying to figure out uh, next steps uh, within the COVID response, specifically the vaccine distribution. So going to focus on contact tracing, um, you know, contact tracing, again, is critical in limiting spread of disease within the community. And in May 2020, we launched our contact tracing efforts. Um, this is not something new, public health. Uh, we've done this in four other diseases, but again, not to this large um, of an extent. And the goal is to reach close contacts of infected persons and give them guidance on how to self-quarantine to further limit transmission of COVID-19. Um, you know, the speed of the spread was very challenging. We had to expand our staff uh, uh, quickly um, and also develop processes um, to be able to keep up with the COVID spread. Uh, we worked uh, closely with the members of Delaware National Guard to reach out to contacts of positive cases. Uh, again, by definition, those have been within six feet of a positive case um, for 15 minutes. Um, and again, that definition changed as well during this time. Um, we, in uh, June 2020, we launched our longer term contact tracing partnership with NORC, N-O-R-C, at the University of Chicago. Uh, we expanded our contact tracing efforts even more. Uh, 171 contact tracers, including 25 DPH field uh, contact tracers, uh, to make home visits as well um, if we were not able to contact uh, close contacts. Um, you know, it is a burdensome uh, process, we understand um, that, you know, we are asking the public for their participation contact tracing, but also um, emphasizing the importance of their participation. Uh, contact tracers ask questions about any symptoms, where people work to assess risk of vulnerable populations, specifically older persons and children. Uh, contact tracers make quarantine recommendations and implement follow-up. Um, contact tracers will not reveal the identity of the person who may have exposed you, even though we've been asked who was it, uh, we kept that identity uh, private um, is considered confidential, and we are taking all steps to ensure each person's health information is protected. Information is not shared with other agencies, including Division of Family Services or Immigration, um, 
and also to show our progress, we included this information in My Healthy Community. And we'll talk a little bit more how important that My Healthy Community website was to share information to the public. Um, you know, we did find challenges in contact tracing. Um, people did not answer the phone call or refused to participate. Um, sometimes we just did not have a good contact information to locate them. Um, and, you know, the interview takes some time and people uh, may elect not to complete the interview process. But again, as part of our communications, we emphasize the importance of participating in contact tracing. I want to mention a little bit about uh, the app, again, to make it less uh, cumbersome. And, you know, our goal is to uh, let people know they've been exposed uh, and, you know, ultimately the cases. We would like to get additional information, but we want to um, make sure that people who've been exposed uh, protect themselves um, and others. Um, so this app um, was launched on September 15, 2020. Um, it's a smartphone app, and hopefully uh, many of you guys are part of this uh, or has this app. Um, DPH encourages Delawareans 18 years and older who live, work, or go to college in Delaware uh, and uses an Android Apple phone to download and use the COVID alert uh, DE. It's available from Google Play and the Apple store, or in the App Store at no cost. It uses Bluetooth low energy technology to quickly alert users if they were in close contact with another app user who shared a positive COVID-19 test result with the app system. And then they can log their symptoms daily, check back and review at any time. Um, you know, people were concerned about their uh, private information. Uh, the COVID alert DE app protects the user's privacy and does not collect or share identifying personal information nor use GPS navigation to collect movement and geographic location. Again, we are very sensitive to protecting people's identity and private information, uh, but we also have a duty to keep people safe, uh, especially during COVID, um, as well as other um, um, exposures or hazards. So just talking about epidemiology, again, we had to evolve our current surveillance system to be able to um, address the rapid spread of COVID-19. Um, one of the uh, focus we had is how to um, upgrade our system uh, to better manage household exposures. You know, there's many situations where um, family members could not isolate appropriate at home. So we had to make sure that we are providing appropriate information and recommendations and asking the right questions to keep people safe at home. Um, so we had to develop a new surveillance system. Um, it allows a comprehensive review of household exposure details among multiple household members. And again, provide functional capacity to track and manage quarantine recommendations. Uh, so this is just an example of how we need to upgrade our processes, our IT systems and so forth to be able to manage this event. And again, our ultimate goal is to keep individuals and the general public safe. So here are some scenes from 2020, um, <clears throat> you know, unbelievable. And, you know, recently I did go to a supermarket, I would say a couple of weeks ago, and there was some, tro uh, some trouble keeping inventory in stock. Uh, but maybe uh, this resonates to many of you, uh, things that we've never seen before, you know, from um, water fountains that we, what recommendation was not to use wa public water fountains to prevent spread of disease, um, you know, talking about social distancing and how important to stay six feet apart. Uh, many stores now have tapes or uh, footprints to remind people that if you're waiting in line, stay six feet apart. And again, you can see some empty shelves, uh, paper towel, um, Toilet tissue was a problem uh, early on. And again, eggs and butters uh, and other dairy products were also very limited. Um, so things that, you know, I've never seen before um, happened uh, during COVID. Um, so as we saw how it impacts businesses and routine operations, we had to look within our own um, programs to see what we need to do to still continue to provide services. And again, um, I want to express my appreciation for the DPH team. Uh, we were spread very thin. Many of us, um, you know, we were working on COVID or were reassigned to focus on COVID, but we had other public health services we had to maintain as much as possible. Uh, so one example would be the medical marijuana program. Uh, as our population resorted to mass ordering food and household supplies and business needs through Amazon and other delivery service, we looked at our own uh, state's medical marijuana uh, program. And we also knew we had to change the way we deliver services. Uh, so we um, offered a home delivery or curbside pickup, like you would think as a Best Buy or other stores, uh, but we had to make sure that people had access to uh, medical marijuana. Uh, so we had to evolve our process as well. And it was very successful, by the way, especially the curbside pickup. Looking at other programs, we had other missions. Um, one one uh, point I wanna make uh, specifically is cancer screening. 
Unfortunately, we did see a decrease in cancer screening efforts relative to cancer screening. Uh, breast cancer mortality rates decreased from 56% higher in African-American women in 2010 to 2014 to 29% higher in 2010 to 2016. Uh, again, that's a success because we worked extremely hard to educate those impacted on the importance of breast cancer screening early detection. Um, Epic Health Research Network conducted analysis that preventive cancer screenings in the U.S. abruptly dropped 86% in colon can cancer screening and 94% breast and cervical cancer screening. Uh, following the declaration of COVID-19 national emergency. And again, this is probably not a surprise to anyone uh, because we realized that um, when um, society was shut down for that period of time, uh, that quote unquote non-emergent services, and unfortunately screenings were, were part of that, um, people stayed at home and did not follow up. Uh, we saw some impacts on chronic diseases as well too. So just give you some more stats. When we look at 19, uh, 2019 to 2020 screening for light cancer screening rates, we saw a 76 decrease in the number of breast cancer screenings performed in March to June 2020 from the same time frame in 2019. We saw a 74% decrease in the number of cervical cancer screenings performed that same time period, again, March to June 2020, compared to the same time frame in 2019, and a 90% decrease in the number of colorectal cancer screenings performed March to June 2020 from the same time frame in 2019. Um, also, just want to mention about health equity. Uh, you know, social determinants of health was critical um, um, in trying to provide uh, services, not just for uh, public health uh, services, but also COVID-19 response. And we work closely with many of our community partners to reduce uh, those gaps in, in, in health equity. Other things that we saw, um, you know, we saw some civil unrest, not as bad as some uh, what we've seen in other states. Um, but definitely, you know, we had uh, seen rallies, um, some uh, peaceful gatherings. Um, you know, this picture on the upper right hand corner was a rally to reopen Delaware, was held in Legislative Mall in Dover uh, on May 1st, 2020. And then we saw other uh, protests um, may not be related to COVID. Uh, the picture down on the bottom left, uh, June 2nd, 2020, it was a peaceful protest um, regarding uh, George Floyd's death in Minneapolis. So continuing our journey in 2021, again, still uh, seeing many surprises. We opened our second year of the pandemic with the unfortunate news announcing the first COVID-19 death of a child. Um, on January 22nd, the state announced the first of numerous mass vaccination events hosted by DPH, uh, DEMA, and other supporting agencies and volunteers, including county EMS workers. Meanwhile, pharmacies began enrolling in the vaccination program. Uh, we closed January with the news of three confirmed cases of the variant, the UK variant, the SARS-CoV-2, COVID, COVID, uh, B117 in Delaware. Um, you know, so, you know, really appreciate our partners in the medical community. Uh, we started early in the vaccination enrollment process, and we had many interested partners um, involved in, in, in the uh, rollout, so to speak. Uh, in February, Governor Carney announced a vaccination focus on underserved communities. On February 16th, FEMA, CDC, HHS, DEMA, DPH held a six-day drive-through vaccination event at the Dover International Speedway. Um, many of you may recall that. At the end of February, the FDA approved the Johnson Johnson vaccine EUA, uh, which we knew many people were holding out for the J&J &J vaccine. Uh, they expressed concerns about the mRNA vaccine. And as a result, we're waiting for J&J. So we were very excited that J&J came to play at the end of February. You know, during this time, testing was still critical. We significantly expanded our testing, and by March 5th, we offered testing at pop-up and curated trailer sites, as well as community sites. Um, we invested in many different uh, modalities of testing. Uh, we didn't want to um, rely on one type of testing, uh, because you can imagine, given the supply demand, um, you know, we didn't want to be uh, handcuffed to only one type of testing. So we made sure we spread uh, the num the types of tests we had in the state so that if one type of testing became unavailable, we still had other uh, opportunities to provide testing in the state. On the vaccination front, walk-in vaccination clinics opened on May 28th. On May 21st, Governor Carney eased business capacity restrictions, lifted the mask mandate, and eliminated social distancing requirements. June 18th, DPH and Delaware National Guard announced the deployment of vaccine mobile units. Less than a month later, on June 1st, Governor Carney announced that 70% Delaware Adults 18 and older had received at least one dose of the vaccine. And later in July, DPH announced a $15 million partnership with the Delaware Department of Education and Quidel 
to provide testing in schools. Uh, you know, we were very excited to see that CDC approved booster doses in August. Um, you know, we all had concerns about waning immunity. We actually saw breakthrough cases that might be linked to waning immunity. Um, so we were excited and supportive of booster doses. Um, soon after that, um, governor announced K through 12 and private school staff, contractors and volunteers must get vaccinated and undergo weekly testing. So here we are in December, we are seeing increase in cases. There's a new variant. We are concerned Omicron. Um, holidays are approaching as well too. So we are, you know, focusing a lot of energy on uh, safe holiday uh, celebrations. Uh, make sure people do get tested before um, large gatherings that we um, celebrate in a safe manner, social distance as much as possible, wearing masks is appropriate. Um, as of December 3rd, we have a total of 155,149 total positive COVID-19 cases since March of 2020 and a seven day average of 432.7. Overall deaths, 2,194. Uh, and unfortunately, this journey is not over yet. Um, we have no idea what's going to happen in 2022. So just kind of stepping back, talking about categories of disasters. And, you know, this is not the first quote unquote disaster we've ever encountered. Uh, there are many different types of disasters, and they could be categorized in many ways. Um, if you look at the uh, categories on the left, uh, one way categorizing disasters is natural. An example would be weather emergency. Human system failure would be the Antrac derailment a couple years back, and war and conflict, the mass shootings, unfortunately, we're seeing uh, throughout the country. You know, the traditional categories of disasters, for those of you in emergency management more familiar, you have natural, chemical events, biological events, radiological, nuclear events, and trauma explosive events. Um, there's a different approach to each of these events, uh, but definitely this pandemic is very unique compared to the other disasters we've, we've encountered in the past. Just going over the uh, cycles of disaster or the phases of disaster, and it's continuous. We never stop. So, you know, once we get through the mitigation and prepares phases and we're in the actual response, we want to focus on recovery in preparation for the next disaster. So, again, uh, our jobs are never done in disaster management. So, just want to talk about specific pandemic challenges. And, you know, many of us are, are emergency management and we talk about how we can. Uh, mitigate and prepare for all types of events. Um, I can tell you as a emergency manager for quite some time, this is a big one. This is the one I was scared of the most. Uh, definitely um, unique challenges compared to, um, let's say, you know, a mass shooting, a hurricane, uh, evacuation facility, and so forth. Uh, this one is definitely uh, the big one. Um, it, it has a worldwide impact, you can see during COVID-19, also the previous pandemic we had with H1N1, um, you know, there was a worldwide impact large number of people uh, were, uh, was impacted. Um, initially for a pandemic, lack of specific therapeutics or interventions, no vaccine, you know, the science is not there yet. We're not sure what's going on. Um, and we did see that both during H1N1 as, as well as COVID-19 and the length of time. I think that's something that we have to remember when we talk about mass shooting and talking about a hurricane, you know, uh, there's a finite um, endpoint, so to speak, you know, uh, here pandemic, it's uh, almost two years now and we're still going on. So to have the resources, to have the resiliency, uh, to make it through the entire length of time is very challenging. Uh, this is something I mentioned before, zombie apocalypse, you know, CDC created this campaign um, to get people more, um, I guess, committed or more involved in preparing a specific pandemic. So just want to kind of make a mention of that um, for those zombie fans, and I'm a zombie fan here, um, that they are usually depicted as being created by infectious virus, which is passed on via bites or contact with body fluids. Uh, zombies are often depicted as being created by uh, that infectious uh, virus. Um, and, you know, there is a diagnosis, uh, ataxic neurodegenerative SADI deficiency syndrome, um, and a new virus mutation of any existing infections attributed to the outbreak. Uh, zombies taking over entire countries, roaming city streets, eating anything that living that got in the way. And the question is, how are you prepared for a zombie apocalypse? And again, you know, tongue in cheek here, but you can see some similarities between, um, you know, a zombie outbreak and what we saw COVID-19, where, you know, we had to protect ourselves from bodily fluids. Um, it spread very quickly. Um, were we prepared for this COVID response? Would we have been uh, prepared for a zombie outbreak? So, you know, early on, and I still remember Dr. Rattay and I did a, did a um, presentation for MSD. And, you know, looking back at that presentation to what we know now, there were a lot of gaps 
um, and a lot of information that we didn't know back then. Um, we had no idea what type of infectious agent this is. You know, we know what a coronavirus is. Uh, it existed in the past, but this particular strain, what's so different about it? Do we treat this like the flu or other viral, uh, viruses that we're familiar with? Uh, limited critical resources uh, played a role. Um, we'll go over that, but, you know, um, we just did not have the resources early on um, that we typically would like. You know, that included PPE, um, also healthcare resources as well, too. And the level of pandemic preparedness varied across the healthcare spectrum, across, of course, uh, across communities as well, too. Um, you know, some organizations, some communities were better uh, prepared and others were not. So uh, hoping that this will uh, get our focus back on preparedness. So in case, uh, unfortunately, another one happens, that would be better prepared. Changing science was very frustrating, and you know I can t I can you know speaking to my hospital and healthcare partners, you know one day you know CDC um, shared this recommendation, and then maybe a couple weeks later we had to change it. And um, you know kudos to the communications team. Um, we have a DPH. I mean, if I felt like they were constantly changing um, recommendations or changing our website uh, because of changing information and in science. Uh, so everything from transmission. If uh, you remember transmission, uh, you know, we weren't sure was it airborne, was it droplet, was six feet good enough? Um, you know, do you need to wear an N95? Do you not need to wear N95? You know, a lot of questions about transmission. There's also discussion, you know, can you um, transmit on common surfaces? Do we need to keep cleaning or not? So hopefully this is resonating to a lot of folks in the room or, or on the computer right now, because, you know, we kept going back and forth you know, initially not quite sure exactly how this uh, virus was transmitted. Um, the thought of asymptomatic spread uh, seemed highly unlikely, but we know that uh, actually happens. Um, that made the uh, response more difficult because you don't need symptoms um, to be able to spread the disease. You know, we rely on symptoms to be able to uh, isolate, uh, but now this asymptomatic spread uh, caused a lot of problems and challenges. Isolation quarantine, you know, 14 days, 10 days, 7 days. Do you test? Do you not test? Test-based strategies, two negative tests, not test-based strategies, time-based, system-based. Um, you know, a lot of questions I receive from my partners, where are we, where are we now? What are we doing now? And, um, you know, a lot of unknowns on how really we can clear someone um, from the infectious state. Diagnostics was challenging as well, too. Uh, initially, you know, the public health lab, the state public health lab was the only lab that had testing mode capabilities. So we work closely with our healthcare partners we talked about cases. I still remember those late calls, 10 p.m. midnight with some of the IPs uh, within the state talking about, does this person, should we test this person, should we not? Uh, but, you know, appreciate their support and understanding that we just did not have the testing capacity capabilities early on. Uh, and overall management, you know, therapeutics, monoclonal antibodies, um, talking about ivermectin, you know, talking about steroids, um, antibiotics, antivirals, you know, the management of the patient changed as well. So a lot of things happening, um, you know, and really appreciate the expertise within the state, infectious diseases, uh, mercy management uh, on trying to figure out how best to approach this. Which led to the concept of crisis standard of care. This is something I did speak of in the past. Um, were we prepared for a crisis standard of care? And definitely this was um, a focus during COVID. You know, was the standard of care impacted? Do we have to find alternatives? You know, were we prepared to make that jump uh, to crisis standard of care mode? And we had to make a lot of tough decisions uh, from management of patients, from healthcare resources, healthcare staffing, uh, PPE even. Uh, so, you know, this is something that we learned very quickly that we had to adjust the way we practice, the just we provide a service given limited resources. Uh, there's this continuum of care, and this was used by the CDC, um, that we were in conventional capacity when it was consistent with daily practice. This is something we did every day. Then we had the middle ground of contingency capacity. It's not consistent with what we do, but it's functionally equivalent. And then finally, crisis where it's not consistent with usual standards of care, but sufficient in a catastrophic disaster. So a good example would be PPE. You know, we went from routine practice of disposal, disposing um, respirators, um, gloves even, gowns, to now we had to reuse them. And I still remember as a practitioner, you know, I had my little brown bag, I had my N95, I had to keep it in the bag, used it for longer than one shift, you know, and I'm sure many of us have done the same uh, because we did not have the resources to 
maintain consistency with daily practices. So we had to do the best we can. And again, CDC supported that approach and we shared that information on how to deal with uh, limited resources. So some examples of limited resources earlier with PPE, you know, some organizations had more uh, stockpile than others. You know, very fortunate enough from a statewide perspective, we had an in-state stockpile. This is something that we fought hard to maintain. So we did have a stockpile, it was definitely not enough for us not to go beyond conventional capacity into contingency or even crisis capacity. Uh, we had to uh, distribute PPE uh, in a careful manner. Um, you know, we had many people requesting PPE and we had to make the tough decisions. We also had to um, provide recommendations how to reuse PPE safely. Uh, but we were fortunate enough, I'm not sure how other jurisdictions did in this, uh, but we did have that stockpile within the state that did uh, was significantly um, helpful. Uh, early on in the pandemic until the uh, supply chains were back to normal, which, you know, there's still some talk that may not be where it should be right now, uh, but definitely much easier to get access to uh, certain resources now than it was initially. Therapeutics, you know, remdesivir, uh, monoclonal antibodies, um, you know, uh, really appreciate um, the clinicians uh, using their individual judgment of when to use these limited resources. Um, you know, we did have our ethics advisory board uh, committee look at remdesivir. We, pr we provided, we um, provided recommendations. We looked at processes because we anticipated that remdesivir was going to be limited. So uh, we worked together to identify a statewide approach on how to distribute remdesivir and the eligibility of remdesivir. Um, hospital beds, you know, uh, totally understand that. Critical care beds are just general hospital beds. Hospitals are very busy right now. Um, you know, very, very much close or even surpassing 100% capacity. Also have challenges with long-term care beds as well too. So, you know, needing to work together on how to um, manage those limited resources. Healthcare staff, critical right now. A lot of reports of decreased staffing across the board, not just healthcare, but also non-healthcare uh, pharmacies as well too. Uh, so what we've done in the past is we put in emergency orders to allow retired personnel to allow uh, those licensed in other states or other jurisdictions to come work in this state as well. So, you know, working closely with our partners to see what we can do to support um, overall operations. Um, I don't think we actually had challenges with oxygen or ventilators, but we were prepared in case, um, you know, looking at opportunities, you know, looking at, you know, uh, oxygen concentrators, looking at vapotherm, looking at high flow, you know, uh, looking at opportunities to uh, increase our ventilator capacity uh, within the state. Um, I, I know other jurisdictions had much more difficulty with these two resources. Um, we had um, stockpiles of ventilators. Um, it wasn't really necessary to be used, which is good, uh, but we do have it in case. And of course, vaccine was very challenging. I mean, early on, we only had thousands of vaccine doses for uh, way more people than that. Um, you know, appreciate the ethics advisory group to meet together to review what CDC, ACIP recommended for their phased approach. Um, looking at our particular situation and providing recommendations to the Director of Public Health on how we should roll out the vaccine um, allocation uh, program. So definitely, you know, I think many of us can, can relate to uh, what we went through uh, in a situation where we never encountered limited resources that um, this affected how we practice and how we provide services. So some response numbers overall. Um, you know, from March 2nd to August 28, 2020, over 100,000 hours were worked at shock and at the warehouse. Again, fulfilling those requests for PP and other um, uh, limited resources. Media inquiries, very busy. March 5th to September 11th, 2020, 1,191 media inquiries. Again, keeping up uh, with public uh, information, making sure that data is out there and making sure that recommendations are, are out there. Uh, because we needed the public's help in fighting this um, war. We see 2,350 business complaints, June 2nd to September 15, 2020. PPE requests, 1,962 uh, requests from February 10th to September 11, 2020, uh, delivered to 1,107 facilities. And talking about the call center, Almost 34,000 calls, over 20,000 emails answered by the call center from March 4th to September 11th, 2020. Again, this was a, a large mission uh, for us in public health. Um, and, you know, appreciate the team, the state. Um, you know, people were reassigned to COVID work. 
Uh, we expand our, our staffing, appreciate support from Human Resources Administration to get uh, processes through to be able to expand as needed uh, during this response. Uh, but you can imagine from a state perspective, you know, we really appreciate the warehouse operations and the stock that we had uh, to be able to support us as much as we could uh, for our uh, partners. Just talking about the overall module metro medical expansion system, this is something that we are proud um, to have in our state. Uh, this is something that, you know, really was in place since I was uh, in public health back in 2005, 2006. Um, it definitely evolved to a certain extent. Uh, but our state health operations center, again, is our Mercy Operations Center uh, for uh, public health. And from there, we have certain, um, I guess, um, plans uh, at our fingertips. Um, so our main um, expansion capabilities would include the warehouse, of course, with resources, points of dispensing, which we use for vaccine uh, distribution, Shelters, we actually opened up a shelter during a winter emergency uh, during COVID. Uh, alternate care sites, um, uh, Governor Bacon, uh, we opened up. We also supported other alternate care sites throughout the state. Centralized more, we did talk about that because early on we didn't know what uh, the death rate was going to be. So we did review our plans for centralized more mass fatality plan and so forth. So, um, you know, this event uh, really um, included many of our plans. Uh, that we've had ready to go. So again, appreciate preparedness uh, to have this uh, available to us as needed. Uh, we were very much involved in healthcare system surveillance through Diane's group um, within EMSPS. You know, we are tracking overall hospital census, ICU census, uh, patients, ventilators, a, a number of COVID positive suspected or PUI cases and staffing in general. Um, you know, through the office of EMS, we looked at call volumes, uh, we did syndrome and surveillance, specifically with ILI or influenza-like illness uh, calls, and responder exposures, uh, workforce uh, capacity, and so forth. So, you know, very much involved in looking at the statewide picture of how our healthcare system is doing. Talking a little about pandemic uh, preparedness, you know, we had this large pandemic influenza summit uh, back in February 21. Uh, 2006. We've had other um, pandemic preparedness events, planning, um, tabletop exercises, exercises, but this was the big one back in 2006. Uh, this was interdisciplinary, uh, health, business, education, religious sectors were involved. Um, so again, we've been planning for a pandemic for quite some time. Um, you know, it happened with H1N1, uh, but this is the one that we were most concerned about. Uh, COVID-19 checked off all those boxes um, that, that really challenged our uh, health system. So talking about infection control, kind of mentioned this earlier on how infection control evolved, um, but basically, you know, uh, we know for sure that social distancing makes a, makes a difference. Um, you know, six feet uh, is what we are um, recommending at this point. In schools, we're recommending three feet given the controlled environment within schools. Uh, mask. Um, I don't know how many of you guys remember the discussion on masks. Which masks count? Which ones do not count? Did it have to be a respirator? Did it have to be fit tested? Uh, there was a lot of discussion about gator. Um, what type, what materials, cloth, disposable, surgical masks. Uh, how many layers? Two layers, more than two layers. Uh, early on, especially uh, within the school system, were transparent masks good enough? Because we understand some challenges uh, in certain situations where you want to be able to see someone's mouth, um, but you know, we're transparent masks. Okay. And then face shields, how about just face shields and not having the, um, the mask itself. So these were all in discussion, um, you know, and the recommendations have changed throughout this time during COVID. Hand hygiene is always important. Ventilation, how much, what's considered good ventilation, what type of ventilation will decrease the risk of spread outdoors versus indoors and environmental cleaning. Uh, can we pass on disease from common surfaces? You know, how frequently do we have to wipe down common surfaces? What kind of agent can we use? Bleach, something else. Um, you know, I remember having these discussions in many forums, you know, working closely with our health systems protection folks, um, you know, trying to figure out what are the appropriate recommendations for environmental cleaning. Uh, so again, just talking about our journey and how things have changed, um, but infection control is still the basics. Social distancing, wearing your mask, um, washing your hands, Outdoors better than indoors. And again, routine cleaning is important. 
diagnostics, you know, the science has changed, the technology has changed as well too. Again, just a reminder, you know, our public health lab was the first lab that could uh, provide or could test. And we work closely with our hospital partners to triage, to allocate limited resources. You know, PCR was considered the gold standard, um, but there was a lot of discussion. What kind of specimen? Nasal pharyngeal versus oropharyngeal. Was anterior nasal good enough? Saliva, oral fluids. So all those were being discussed, a lot of data, a lot of science around that. Rapid antibody testing came about. Was that good? Was that not good? You know, the IgM versus IgG, you know, um, would they help determine acute infection versus um, previous exposure? Is this a similar uh, disease process or antibody uh, response that we saw in other diseases? And the rapid antigen, you know, observe versus monitor. Now we have over the counter. Um, so a lot of more testing modalities available out there. Um, and I think we were in a good position because we had so many different types of testing. Again, look at our website uh, to find out where you can get tested. Um, many different types of testing out there. And our turnaround times have gotten much better. Again, uh, thanks to our lab folks uh, to be able to expand their lab operations from just a um, resource lab uh, to now a commercial lab of some sort, you know, with thousands of specimens going through their labs on a daily basis. So as of, I think I got those numbers over the weekend, 2,526,000 tests performed in the state, 910,000 persons tested. Just talking about vaccine now, um, one over 1 million, almost 1.5 million administered doses of COVID-19 vaccine reported to the state system between December of 2020 and December 10th of 2021. And this is a picture of one of our large vaccination sites. Really cool picture. Thank you, Deldot, for this picture. But you can see the cars, uh, the wait lines, things like that. So, um, you know, this came from My Healthy Community, these numbers, and I'll talk more about My Healthy Community later on. So there was a lot of planning involved from the DPH side regarding vaccine. We met internally and regularly with the office of the governor's office. Um, you know, we met weekly at least, sometimes more than weekly initially early on. Uh, we trained immunizations program staff to utilize national vaccine tracking system. Uh, we did um, tabletop exercises to make sure that our allocation process works from, from the request to the logistics, delivery, and the Delvax piece of it as well, too. Uh, we had multiple stakeholder meetings, uh, weekly meetings on Friday, if I recall, uh, from the task force. Communications also had a subcommittee as well, too, making sure information is being shared. Uh, our ethics advisory group met initially to come up with our phase strategy approach uh, to vaccine allocation. Um, our logistics team involved in training received a dummy shipment from Pfizer to make sure that um, we were prepared uh, to accept um, through uh, ultra cold chain. Uh, centralizing vaccine program staff as well as enrolling vaccinators in the federal program. So a lot of work behind the scenes. And again, appreciate everyone's support and those that were involved in some of our planning activities. We had large and small vaccination events statewide, DMV sites, curative sites. Uh, we had a couple events at the Chase Center and some smaller sites as well too. Uh, other challenges, and you know, I'm not sure how Andrea and her team survived this, um, but you know, incredible job from our office communications on, on just coordinating messaging to the medical community, to the general public. Uh, they had to, again, update messaging uh, given new CDC recommendations. So here's some general messaging, social media graphics. Um, again, trying to engage the public, uh, especially with uh, vaccine. Testimonials, we thought it was important to hear from Delawareans um, why they got the vaccine. This was very powerful, um, you know, just to see that, you know, everyday, everyday Delawareans uh, were getting the vaccine for these reasons. And a lot of resources, collateral materials, you know, definitely challenging keeping the website updated uh, given just the change information constantly. Uh, we have our de.gov slash coronavirus website. That's our main website. Uh, that has information for the public, providers, and business organizations. Uh, we have the COVID vaccine website as well, too, include a vaccine safety section. And again, for those that are not familiar with My Healthy Community, please be familiar with My Healthy Community. This was our I guess, main uh, platform to share information regarding cases, hospitalizations and deaths, vaccine, testing, uh, contact tracing, and so forth. And finally, I just want to talk quickly about 
the law. And this is something, you know, we want to give credit to Joanna Souter, who's our DOJ, um, and basically how the law was challenged during all this. Um, law is a critical public health tool, and it can be leveraged to help public health or can be a constraint that inhibits public health response. And there's been tensions at times you can, you can um, imagine, but really appreciate the support from DOJ um, balancing individual liberties with really how to protect the public good um, and really supporting us during this time, uh, COVID. We had to make a lot of hard decisions and we really need the backing of our legal team uh, to be successful in our response. So just a general uh, overview, the Public Health Authority, states have primary police power functions based on the 10th Amendment of the Constitution. And some of our public health powers include surveillance and reporting. Um, we do mandate um, reporting of uh, results, both positive and negative, for COVID. Uh, epidemiological investigations uh, involve case investigations as well as contact tracing, uh, vaccination. Um, you know, certain states um, have mandated vaccination for certain situations. Um, and isolation and quarantine, the ability to force isolation or quarantine depending on the uh, situation. A good example would be Ebola. People returning from uh, West Africa um, were mandated to quarantine in certain states. There needs to be a balance between law and policy for good of the public. Uh, mandatory public health actions to protect public health. Uh, some examples will include the Clean Indoor Air Act, mandatory childhood lead testing and seatbelt requirements. Uh, some examples specific for COVID, shelter-in-place requirements, closing schools and daycare centers, prohibiting large gatherings, and again, isolation and quarantine. Enabling statutes granting DHS authority. Uh, what can we do as a Department of Health and Social Services? Um, we have authority over many disease reporting investigation duties, also certain types of businesses as well. Um, DPH use its statutory and regulatory authority to require reporting of all COVID-19 test results to DPH in March of 2020, and reporting of demographic information DPH April 2020. Again, we understand uh, the importance of individual liberties, but we had to balance that with the public good. So travel restrictions, isolation, quarantine, and we talked about an uh, example in Ebola. Uh, again, impacted individual liberties, but again, for the overall good. Data was critical, but we also had to make sure we protected private information. And again, we've come to battles at times where people wanting more specific information, but we as public health abided by HIPAA, um, also uh, protection of, of data. Uh, we take this very seriously. Um, so data privacy security could be considered a hindrance, but again, I think we did a good job balancing the need to share information to protecting the uh, private information. So public health information should be protected as much as possible. Um, you know, we abide by HIPAA. We had other regulations and uh, legislation involved that protected uh, this information. Uh, you know, we are, our enforcement authority is limited to enabling statutes or the governor's de uh, delegation of executive authority under the Mercy Powers Act. Um, so we had to check in uh, closely uh, with uh, our legal team to make sure what we were doing was appropriate or allowable. And of course, this caused some state and federal tensions um, as well. Um, but this is all lessons learned, hoping that we can learn from this and, uh, you know, um, do better in the near future if we had to. So this is my last slide, just talking about One Health overall. This is something that we talk about given our experience with COVID, uh, that, you know, human health is not siloed, uh, that we have to work closely uh, with other entities to protect not just human health, but also animal health, environmental health. I mean, COVID impacted all of the above. And this is an approach that CDC supports. Um, and this is something we're looking to expand within uh, Delaware. So uh, I appreciate Doug Riley's efforts in, in um, spearheading the One Health approach um, and some more to come regarding One Health. So in summary, uh, hopefully this not cause a lot of PTSD. Uh, you know, thinking back what we've done uh, for the past almost two years um, really brought back some memories, both good and bad, some more traumatic than others. Uh, but really, I can't speak enough on the partnerships we had in the state, um, not just within the state government, but also within the communities that really this was not a DPH event. This was a statewide event. And really we as DPH could not have done it alone and appreciate the networks the 
uh, partnerships, even friendships that developed uh, during this time. And hopefully, you know, when we get through this, that we take the lessons that we learn, the relationships that we build, and, you know, continue uh, those um, uh, towards the future. And hopefully, <laughs> if we have to deal with another pandemic, that we have um, learned some things from this, and we'll use that uh, to benefit the state. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hong. A um, couple of questions in the in the Q&A for you. The first one is, of course, will you share your slides? Absolutely. Okay, cool. Um, all right, here we go. Um, question one, I was wondering why rapid PCR testing is not the standard at this time as the turnaround time is so much faster than a normal PCR. So that's a good question. Um, you know, there's still some signs behind the rapids and the, the rapid PCR um, you know, just came into effect, so to speak. Um, we had a um, point of care PCR through the Abbott ID now, but we knew that the uh, accuracy was not as good um, as the regular PCR. But also one of the advantages of doing tr traditional PCR is that we had the opportunity to sequence uh, to look for variants. Versus the rapid PCR, we don't get the specimen for sequencing. Uh, so again, it really depends on uh, the purpose of the testing. Um, and there are some pros and cons with all testing that's available in the state. Thank you for that. So there's a there's another question very similar. So I'll ask that next. Um, thank you for all of your and the team's efforts. You are wonderful. Um, did a home COVID test, was I supposed to report it to you? So if you did a home COVID test, and assuming it's an over-the-counter, um, that it's not uh, under the same um, legal language as other tests because it's not monitored or not observed. Uh, so we do offer the opportunity for you to report it. Um, if you have a positive test in particular, but no, you're not required to report that. Okay, thank you. Um, there are two questions here regarding uh, first responder requirements. Um, so the first one, I'll give you give them to you both and maybe you can answer them both at the same time. What are the first responder requirements for COVID positive patients that arrive via EMS? Is it still a requirement to report slash complete the state form assuming PPE is standard with current CDC guidelines? And then the second one is what is the expectation regarding reporting potential exposure to EMS from a COVID positive patient transferred to the hospital? Right, so, so definitely it, as an infectious disease, the, there should be a reporting process in place as in other diseases such as meningitis um, would be a good example that you know working closely with those um, acute care entities that if there's an EMS personnel that is exposed um, that there should be that reporting process um, for COVID as well as other diseases. So that's, that's um, and hopefully that the contact information is appropriate where you have a designated infectious disease officer, um, but you know, the process should not change regarding whether it's COVID or other disease processes. But in terms of the state form, you know, I'll defer to OEMS on uh, what their preference is for reporting. Um, but yes, whatever the current process is, that has not changed as far as I understand. All right, and there was a follow-up to that that the EMS designated officer contact information is old and lacking, where should they receive updated information? So that's something where I would advise um, those uh, EMS agencies to make sure you contact your, your local hospitals and let them know uh, what the appropriate uh, uh, information is and make sure it's updated through uh, OEMS as well. Because at times that the hospitals do contact OEMS because they're having trouble um, contacting the designated uh, officer. Uh, so make sure that information is updated in our records in OEMS as well as the individual hospitals. All right, thank you. Next question, how can we increase our COVID testing in Delaware? Our testing numbers per 100,000 are very low right now and our percent positive is very high. Yeah, so it's really a balance between whether it's a supply or demand issue. Um, you know, we did see a bump right before Thanksgiving that people are interested in testing. Um, so the question is whether is it because we don't have enough access to testing or is it because people are not interested? Uh, so, you know, working closely with the office communication to really push out the importance of, of testing. And as you can imagine, you know, more and more um, requ uh, requirements, mandates, or recommendations are for weekly testing for certain uh, uh, sectors. Um, that, you know, we're going to look at, see how our supply goes with testing. But, you know, I've received calls at times where basically, you know, certain testing sites are very busy. And there's other times where basically our testing sites are not busy. So I think it's both looking at our capacity, but also encouraging people to get tested. Thank you. Um, next question. Great review of our COVID journey. Thank you for your leadership. 
Considering our current burden of COVID-19 disease in hospitals, are there any plans for DPH setting up mon monoclonal antibody infusion centers to prevent hospitalizations? Yeah, so um, definitely the technology for monoclonal antibodies have increased and, you know, working closely with EMSPS, um, we are looking at opportunities to get more people or more providers to be able to able to um, provide monoclonal, but also we have other ways of giving monoclonal antibodies, no longer just infusions. There are injections now um, as well that's available. So, you know, we're working closely with the federal government to kind of find out how these are being distributed. Uh, but, you know, we really appreciate those that are offering monoclonal antibodies. Uh, thank you for your support, um, but we are encouraging others that can give the monoclonal antibody to please participate in the program. And again, that's through shock and through EMSPS. Thank you. Uh, next question. Given what's happening with COVID and flu right now and the situation in the hospitals, what would the threshold be to reinstate an indoor mask mandate? So that's uh, being discussed right now at the governor's office level. Um, you know, we want to balance, um, again, individual liberties with the need to uh, mandate infection control practices like we did before. Uh, so we are in, in discussion about that. That is potentially on the table. Uh, so more to come on that if we decide to pull that trigger. All right, last question. You had to react to the pandemic as things happened. What do you wish you did differently? Hmm. You know, it's, um, it's interesting. I think this is a trick question, but I think, um, I guess from a personal level, and I think this is not just me, but many members of our team, um, I think what I wish I did differently is self-care. And that's why I've kind of put that take, take a moment uh, slide in there uh, that, you know, Dr. Rate, Crystal, myself, uh, EMSPS, infectious diseases, epidemiology lab. I mean, we were constant, I mean, for quite some time and we kind of lost ourselves in the process. Um, you know, we're at a point right now we're trying to provide, you know, some relief to our team. Uh, but, you know, seeing this other, you know, um, peak, you know, I'm not sure how long that's going to last. But I think what me personally, I think I, I wish I could have um, slowed down just a little bit. I, again, my EMS disaster medicine ED background is just constant go. And, you know, I mean, so proud of our team that we were nonstop for a long period of time. But um, I think there was a cost to that. Um, so I kind of wish that we just kind of slowed down just a little bit, um, whether that would have impacted our response, not sure, uh, but really proud of our team for, for the work that we did to, to keep this, um, pandemic under control. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Hong, for your presentation and, and all of the questions that you answered. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you.